The reading for the second Sunday of Ephany is Psalm, the 36th chapter. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadows of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your, your river of delights. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. The word of the Lord. And the Holy Gospel is found in the Gospel of John, the second chapter. The next day, there was a wedding in celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not my problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But the, his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone's had a lot to drink, he takes out the, la the least expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to well, let's pray. Oh God, let the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and the one who saves. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think they liked that walking good morning. Well, we're going to talk about four or five of the verses that are in the psalm that we read today. I'm going to take you back to your junior high English class where we learned about similes and analogies. Remember that? I think similes are the ones where you say it's like this and analogies are the ones like the one up on the screen where you don't say it's like this, but you say it in a different way. We're going to talk about what God's love is like. That's the first couple verses. And then what are the impacts of those things on our lives? Because that's the next couple verses in the psalm. So I want you to put on your caps that take you back to that and think about how we compare things. Oh, Eileen, stop, stop shaking your head. You know you remember. You... <laughs> God's unfailing love. That word unfailing love, well, those words are actually one Hebrew word. It's a word that I have tattooed on my wrist. It's chesed, chesed. And it means steadfast love, unfailing love, loyalty, faithfulness, um, a whole bunch of those things that mean that God will never give up on us. God's unfailing love. So, so the psalmist said to God, your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. For the psalm writer, he's picturing something that we have trouble seeing when we live close into the city. But I'd like you to close your eyes. Imagine you're up in Grand Marais in a tent. And, and it's a, yeah, don't shake your heads. No, it's an imagination, Bruce. Um, you close your, and you, and you step out of the tent, it's 11 o'clock at night, and it's a clear night. And you can see all those thousands of stars. And it looks like it goes on forever. 
and it does. You can open your eyes. That's what the psalmist is telling us God's love is like. It is over us and around us and it covers every part of us. And it's so big, it's so huge, and it's so steadfast that we can't imagine a failure in it. We can't imagine a failure in this love of God because God's love is unfailing. It is as vast as the heavens. When you imagine what the heavens are like, this is going beyond the clouds and going out into the things that we can only imagine we see unless um, like Rick Anderson has a telescope and he can take pictures of galaxies far away. God's love is like being able to take pictures of those things far away. God is so much bigger, so much grander, so much more spacious in his feeling toward us that we can't even begin to imagine it. Then we're told your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Now that, that's a little bit closer in. God's faithfulness to us, the things that God does that we can see and taste and touch and feel, the things that prove to us that God is with us and loves us, they're a little closer. They're like clouds. And the clouds are in the sky and rain comes down and the sun is shaded from us because of the clouds, God's faithfulness is a caring blanket that stretches out the sky over us. Isn't that lovely? That's what God's faithfulness is like. And then God's righteousness, the, God's justice and mercy, what God does is right. It's like the mighty mountains. You hear a theme here. These are all nature analogies. They're all things that we can compare nature to and they're all significantly sized things. Things that are too big for us to actually be able to imagine so that we understand that God is bigger than our imaginations. No matter how big our imaginations are, God is more. God's righteousness, that unbending sense of right and wrong that God mixes with mercy and forgiveness. It's like mighty mountains. It's strong and unyielding and unmoving and it is certain and it is fixed. And God has that as a sense of God's righteousness. This is huge. Because, because we need to understand the scripture then as teaching us in part about the righteousness of God. When the Bible tells us and when Jesus tells us how we are to live and how we are to conduct ourselves out there and even in here, then it is this righteousness that's like mountains. We can stand firmly in what we, we uh, have been told by God. Yesterday, I went out for lunch with my great nieces and nephew, and of course, their parents have to come too. But we went to um, Teppanyaki, the Teppanyaki Grill on University. Oh man, they have a chocolate fountain. But that wasn't the best part. The best part was when I got the bill. <laughs> I had no idea. But, but my great niece, you may remember some months ago, I told you, I asked the kids to tell me about a time when they prayed for something and God answered their prayers. And my eight-year-old great niece said there were some girls at the, her church who were being mean to her, and then God gave her a friend. And she asked me yesterday, did you tell the people at church about that? And I said, I did, Maddie, I did. What did they think? I said, you know, I think you helped some people by being willing to let me tell your story. When we talk about God's righteousness and how God directs our paths and how God tells us and shows us through circumstances what to do, that's God's righteousness at work. Now I want to take another page again out of Pastor Tim's um, book last week where he had us pray a little of the Aramaic Lord's Prayer and we did a little bit of work in silence. I'm going to invite us to be silent for just a moment because I'd like you to think about 
what God's righteousness, justice, and mercy combined are like to you. When you think about God's holiness, what is that like to you? Just close your eyes and ask yourself that for a moment. Well, I hope you were able to come up with a picture. Um, For me, I think both of mighty um, oceans and mighty mountains. God's justice is deep, like the ocean depths. And that's the fourth one. That I think that what that's telling us is that God's justice is, um, God has a sense of justice that runs power th- powerfully through God's self. At the same time, um, the mighty ocean depths are not unmoving and they aren't without life. Things move and live and breathe in the ocean depths. And that's what God's justice is like. It's combined with that life-giving mercy that says, God knows when we've done the right and wrong thing, and so do we know when we've done the right and wrong thing, right? But God's mercy and God's justice take us into that deep place where we can learn. Our sinfulness exists um, for us not so that we can feel like horrible human beings in our sinfulness. Our sinfulness exists in us so that we can learn about the depths of God's righteousness and justice and mercy so that we can come to be more gracious, compassionate, and loving human beings. And then I kind of like the next verse which just goes in a different direction altogether. You care for people and animals alike, oh Lord. Okay, that's good, that's okay. Now we'll go to the next one. How precious is your unfailing love? So now we've moved to, God, we, we learned that God's unfailing love was like the heavens. Now we're learning what it is for us. God's unfailing love is precious. It's like when I ask the children, what are your mom and dad's love like, your grandparents' love like? What is God's love like? Well, God's love is not harsh and cruel and demanding. God's love is precious and heartwarming and heart-changing. So we have that God's love is like the, as big as the heavens and that it's precious to us. Then we have All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. Now you can picture that one of a couple ways. One, you can picture it as an an angel standing powerfully with wings and sheltering you and sheltering you in your life, comforting you and being present over you. Or if you grew up on a farm, you can go to Jesus' own analogy about this from the New Testament where he said how often I have longed to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. And you've seen pictures of that, right, with the chicks just kind of burrowed under the mother's body and her wings spread out to take care of the chicks. That's how God feels toward you. God wants you to have that sense of being encompassed, surrounded, protected by the love of God on your worst day you are still shadowed and sheltered by God's wings. And not only Christians. Notice what the text says, all humanity. And what that means is that God expects that of us as well. Part of our responsibility on earth is to care for all humanity as God does. Third, the third benefit to us is that God feeds us from the abundance of his own house. This God who, um, you know, Jesus said, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. This God who provides, feeds us from God's own abundance. Now, when we don't have enough, it can be hard to think about abundance. But the fact is that God's abundance reaches out generously to us. 
and provides in our lives sometimes what we need, sometimes more than we need, and sometimes changing our assumptions about what we really need. God is always there providing. And then we come back to the water image in the fourth case, letting us drink from the river of delights. God's wisdom was like that deep ocean. And now we're invited to drink from that deep water. We're invited to participate in that wisdom. I think it's not, and uh, I know it's not an, uh, an accident that as Lutherans, we talk about water a lot. Because water is, oh dear, water is that thing that washes us clean, both physically and spiritually. It is that thing that comforts us. When you're thirsty, does anything taste as good as cold water? If you've been on a hike, I, this has only happened to me one time in my life. If you've been, because I don't hike. If you, you, that's no surprise, probably. Um, if you've been on a long hike and you come to a stream of crystal clear water, don't you want to just plunge your face into it and get it on all over your face and get a big drink and get your hair wet and splash yourself? And that's what God's, God's river of life is like for us. Spiritually, we can bury our face into the wisdom and love of God and we can find the presence of God to sustain us, to give us new energy, to give us new ways of life. We use water in baptism. We, we uh, live with water. For God, you, God, are the fountain of life and the light by which we see. So God is our water and our light. And in both of those images, we find things that we really need for life. So the psalmist is telling us, you, God, are an essential to our lives. Here's what I'd like you to do this week. Um, I'd like you to pull out your Bibles and go to Psalm 36. The first part of Psalm 36 is, please kill the evil people, God. You can skip those four verses. And then read five through 10. And then it goes back to kill those bad guys, God. So just read five through 10 and ask yourself, which of these images most teaches me something I need to know about God? Because I promise you there will be one there for you. Amen.